Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Taylor. I'm a professor of international studies here at the, univers at the American University School of International Service. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have with us today a distinguished alumna of the School of International Service, Ambassador Liliana Ayalde. Um, we are going to have a discussion today of about 45 minutes in length, at the end of which we'll have Q&A for the audience. It, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, I would ask that you please uh, submit it through the Q&A function. You should find that at the bottom of your screen uh, in the Zoom window. Closed captioning for those who would like it is available. Uh, please click on the option for closed captioning at the bottom of your screens. I'd also ask uh, that you please not record this session. We will be recording the webinar and it will be available on the SIS YouTube channel uh, when it's concluded. So without further ado, let me introduce Ambassador Liliana Ayalde. Ambassador Ayalde has had an incredible career uh, both within USAID and also uh, as representative of the United States in a variety of high-ranking roles. She was, uh, as you know from the announcement, uh, ambassador to Brazil. She has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Caribbean, Central America, and Cuban Affairs. She was ambassador to Paraguay. She has served as a foreign policy advisor for the U.S. Southern Command. Uh, really just a, a wonderful uh, moment to have you here, Ambassador Ayalde. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I would like to begin with a question that I know that all of our SIS students will be very curious about, which is about this stellar career. Uh, you've progressed from your undergraduate work at SIS uh, to positions that I've just described. And now in your post-government career, uh, you are serving as a senior advisor to a number of think tanks, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as the Latin American program at the Wilson Center. So I am just wondering, and I know that all of our students will be wondering, how did you plan this trajectory as an undergraduate uh, studying at SIS? Good afternoon, uh, Professor Taylor. Thank you for that very warm introduction and greetings to everyone who's connected. Um, I'm really thrilled to be able to reconnect with SIS uh, that played such an important role in, in preparing me for what has been this incredible trajectory. Um, a little unconventional for the Foreign Service and um, for uh, joining the foreign affairs community really was kind of um, uh, the way it happened, I think was, if I look, if I could see your faces uh, of, this, uh, of the students, um, undergrads going through um, SIS, different emphasis in their studies, I was probably sitting there uh, doing, you know, I had an interest in Latin American studies, an interest in diplomacy and foreign affairs, but I really wasn't clear on where I was going to take that and what I was going to do with it. Um, uh, even when I went and got my master's, where I decided I'd get a little bit more technical and get in, and actually hone in on uh, public health, um, although I really knew I wanted to give back and work work internationally, I just you know didn't know where I was going to shape that. And as it turned out, um, there was an opportunity that came across. Uh, uh, and uh, it was one of my professors who recommended that I apply to a, a, a program with, within USAID, United States Agency for International Development, at the time that allowed you to compete. In, and it was a, a rigorous uh, selection process, but you could actually enter into the Foreign Service once you did a kind of an internship. And I thought, well, you know, I'd give it a try, but it wasn't. Uh, I didn't really, again, it wasn't clearly mapped out for me, although certain, certain people probably map out their entire lives. I just kind of went as I, uh, as I felt it was something that I liked. And as it turned out, 38 years later, I had this career that I woke up and I thought, oh, my God, I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, because I was always doing something different. Um, and I think 
that people, when they hear me say, oh, you had 38 years in the same job, you know, public service for 38 years in government, that sounds like boring. I did not have one moment of boredom because my assignments came for different reasons, um, totally unplanned. In my case, um, it was, uh, I was doing things with a passion. I enjoyed everything from my first tour in Bangladesh being assigned as a Latin American specialist uh, with the languages and everything. And there I go, I get assigned to Bangladesh. Why? Because you sign up for wo worldwide availability and you kind of get, have to get tested and make sure that you can be adaptable and, and flexible and, and be able to pivot. And I guess those are all lessons I learned early on. Uh, you know, I had my skill set that I got from university, Latin American studies and my languages. But um, what I learned early on as I mapped out this trajectory, and now it's really more after I finished that I had a chance to reflect on it, it was really the passion of the work, you know, that I really enjoyed it. And have I not liked it, I think it would have been very evident. Uh, and uh, I think leaders look towards um, people who are enjoying what they're doing because that's contagious and that inspires others. Uh, and then so that kind of built on my trajectory because as I look back, every single assignment, I was invited to go and do this and do that. Uh, it, I had planned to do something different, but because of foreign policy priorities, things came up. I went to Guatemala to close a program and there was a democratic election and there it was, you know, it was a huge surge of uh, funding. I ended up staying there five years. I was going to go to the Caribbean and they said, no, they've just had elections in, in Nicaragua. We need you there. We have been absent for 12 years. You need to start the program. And I said, oh, okay. And, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then I got tapped on the shoulder uh, for one of the biggest honors to be uh, the representative of the U.S. president in different countries. And the first time it was Paraguay. Um, I was with USAID, so that was not in my, you know, I was not looking for that. It was just somebody said, you know, you're doing a good job. We think you have the, the skills that the profile for uh, chief of mission, we'd like you to consider that. And I said, oh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. What do you mean? Um, so I left what I was doing in Colombia and it was under Plan Colombia. It was very exciting at the time. But, you know, what more excitement and privilege than serving as ambassador to, um, to Paraguay. And then, of course, the same thing happened with Brazil. I was uh, deputy assistant secretary at the time, and I got a call on behalf of the secretary of state saying, we need you in Brazil. And I had lived there as a child and uh, spoke Portuguese. And I said, oh, my God, and the Olympics and the World Cup and you know, kind of juggled some personal things with my daughter going to, to, to her senior year. And, and we all decided as a family, it was the right thing to do. And it was, by God, it was just a wonderful experience. And then the last assignment, uh, official assignment was to the Southern Command, which, you know, it, it's unusual, um, but uh, it, it was a detail uh, at ambassadorial rank within the command. And uh, I accepted it. And it was a different world. And I learned a lot about the military. So I ended up doing this trajectory took me from development, diplomacy and defense. So I'm totally unplanned, but it was the passion, uh, being able to work with teams and, uh, and, and the interpersonal skills and the language skills that uh, on top of the uh, preparation that I got at SIS on Latin American studies that helped me. That's great. Well, I, I love the story of beginning your career as a Latin Americanist in Bangladesh, uh, and more importantly, the the advice to, to enjoy what you're doing. Um, so I, I did want to ask you about w one of these very strange transitions in your life. Uh, you were nominated by President Obama to be ambassador to Brazil in 2013. And you just mentioned, you know, this was at a time when it, it, Brazil was probably the rosiest assignment available to a senior person in the State Department. Um, it looked 
marvelous from Washington, D.C. Uh, Brazil was about to host the World Cup, then the Olympics. Um, President Dilma Rousseff was scheduled for a state visit to the United States. And then uh, within a few months of your Senate confirmation, everything took a turn southward. Um, the, there were a variety of disclosures. Uh, there was a disclosure of the Snowden, um, the dis Snowden disclosure of U.S. wiretaps, uh, including uh, Brazilian officials, and that soured relations, and then a variety of domestic upheavals within Brazil. And so what looked like a very cushy assignment, what might have looked like a cushy assignment a few months earlier, suddenly um, was an incredibly challenging and, and rapidly changing assignment. So tell us a little bit about that and how you adapted uh, to, the, to those really remarkably changing circumstances. Yes, indeed, that was uh, quite a, a pivot that I had to do from everything very being very rosy. And, and you're right, at the time I was invited, it, there was a, an urgency in getting me down there because the, the President Rousseff was coming up and there was a series. So everything um, surrounding a state visit allows there to be a lot of advancement on uh, different policy issues. So there was a lot of work. So it was very exciting. And it probably wasn't even months. It was weeks within weeks because it was all rushed to get me through. Unlike today, when some of these uh, nominations take a long time, for, for there was a bilateral agreement, I guess, that, that, that I needed to get down there quickly. And things soured uh, to the worst moment in bilateral relations, uh, historically. Um, never been worse. And so uh, I, I, I was, you're right, everything was on the up. And then I arrived the day both presidents stopped and decided to postpone the, the state visit. Um, I inherited a staff that was tremendously demor demoralized because all the work that had been done to get agreements signed, to you know, get high level engagements and all of this. And then all of that was truncated because the president said, absolutely, that is Dilma Rousseff said, absolutely no political level engagements. And so that was, um, you know, everything had to stop. We couldn't bring high level visits. We couldn't sign things. Um, and what that meant is that I had to pivot and lead um, a relationship or navigate it uh, to try to uh, get it back on track, uh, but also to work the spaces that, that, that we could work on. And the thing about Brazil is that it's, it's huge. And so um, it was amazing how you know, th there's so much in common that I had, um, and I knew Brazil, but you know, once you're there, you realize that there's, there's so much affinity between, between our two countries that you can find spaces to work on. And so I kind of decided, okay, we'll really devote our time to the people to people engagement and worked a lot on education, on uh, uh, the commercial relations between the private sector. There's so much going on. And, and then the regional aspects of our engagement, you know, so Brasilia is one thing, the polit political um, uh, co concentration is there and obviously politics matter. But as you went out to the Northeast and the South and, you know, there was lots of engagement and lots of interest. And of course, business continued to flourish um, despite the complexity. So we looked for these spaces where we can actually make things happen. We also used sports diplomacy. Um, you know, there was this was these mega events were just very unifying. Everybody was just in a buzz, and and uh, you know, so it gave us an opportunity to bring the youth in to talk about sports, to talk about the things that we had in common, um, and there was a lot there that we could do together. Um, and in that, under that umbrella, um, and the White House was very interested in getting the relationship back on prep, which really helps. Uh, and President Obama at the time designated the then Vice President Biden to kind of lead the effort of trying to reconstruct the relationship. And so that was uh, fascinating also, because we used to, 
the first visit under the World Cup. Uh, the U.S. team was playing um, uh, Ghana, as I recall, and we organized a, a private meeting between the vice president and the then president to try to start rebuilding uh, that, that relationship. It, it worked. At the end of the day, uh, we were able to bring things back on track to the point where she did get a, an official visit, I believe it was in 2015. Um, and we were able to relaunch all the different dialogues and agreements. And so, but it wasn't until she gave that signal that her ministers, which were really interested in engaging at the political level. So we were doing all the kind of the technical level stuff. So there was a lot of things going on. We were very, very busy and trying to take advantage of the time. But we couldn't do that high level stuff that was really needed to really drive it. Um, once she gave the signal and once we had that official visit, um, then we could really work at it. And actually, we were lucky because at that point, her own situation started really debilitating, becoming very politicized. And it was Lava Jato and all of these other things got in the way that make the relationship very complex. But we could proceed with with different um, policy commitments that we had. So, so yeah, it was a fascinating time. There's a, an iconic picture, a photo of Biden and Dilma Rousseff that you brought to mind now uh, when they were engaging, I believe, at the World Cup itself. And it was, you know, one of the first public manifestations of this breaking of the ice. Uh, so I can imagine all the work that went into making that happen. Let me let me pick up on something you just said, though. You talked about uh, Dilma Rousseff's impeachment and you were there for that as well. Um, and, you know, everybody here today knows that it's an election year in Brazil. Um, it's a moment of extreme polarization in Brazilian politics. There's considerable fear among a portion of Brazilians that democratic institutions uh, and democratic processes could be interrupted in the run up to the election or between the first and the second round or um, there could be an event similar to um, a Brazilian January 6th. And so, you know, based on your experience, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's no surprise for me to say that there is a suspicion of the role of the U.S., that many Brazilians are wary of the U.S. and the role uh, that it could play if there were a sign of an institutional break. And so I'm just wondering, based on your experience in Brazil at another time of extreme institutional uh, crisis, the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, um, how, do you, how do you think the United States can square this circle, supporting democracy on the one hand, but also not getting so involved that it, it triggers uh, a response by those who are wary of US um, intervention in in politics? Yeah, well, I think that's a, a, a great question. And certainly for those of us who are interested in foreign policy and foreign affairs, there's always, um, we have to be very tuned in to what our role has been in the past. And so history does matter. Words matter. Messages matter. And so um, uh, as the representative of the U.S. government, we have to be particularly careful about the messages that are given so we're not misrepresented and that there are many who want to misrepresent us. So there's all of that. So there's it, it gets very messy. And the U.S. government is very large. So we have, let's say, under an embassy, different agencies. So getting a unified message is always important. And I'm talking just gener generally speaking, not necessarily on the situation today. So that all comes with uh, you know, being a, a US ambassador or being a representative of the, U the United States because of the history and, and so forth. So we have to be extremely careful, particularly doing these domestic um, issues, whether it's the impeachment, the Lava Jato, and certainly during these very high profile and controversial elections. And I think um, today, it's, I mean, it's not only in Brazil, but the, the entire region has had this polarization. So 
our role and what we say um, is has to be very carefully calibrated. We care about democracy, and, and so we have to be very clear about that. And I think uh, having lived in, in, in Brazil and seen the institutions in action, I have full confidence in the strengths of the, of the institutions. And I think that has been the message and what's been transmitted. So I think that is important. That's not to say that there may be some that are trying to derail it, you know, whether through uh, fake news or intentionally, but we have to be careful not to be pulled into that and become the, um, the one that is accused of manipulating that. I think the interventionists, uh, the US as an inter interventionist, is something of the past. And we have worked very hard not to be uh, meddling, not to be interpreted as, as the, the one making the decisions. And, you know, so we're still going through through that. That's very much out there. And there are certainly a lot of, of, of people and uh, that, that, that want to accuse us, that want to point the finger at us. So, so we have to be careful. But we stand by principles. And so we have to say something. We can't be quiet because by being quiet, we're not saying, you know, we're, we're, that is a message. So that becomes a very delicate um, path. Uh, and, you know, that's what people get paid for, right? Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's not easy. And these, these elections are, are certainly very um, uh, aggressive in the language and and in today's world where social media is, it plays such a large part that becomes even more uh, vibrant and, 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 and dangerous at times. So, so it is, it is um, uh, um, a very real um, daily uh, issue that we need to look at. And, you know, during, during the impeachment process, looking back when I was there, I, I made a point of making sure that we didn't have any of our agencies going off uh, the reservation saying things that would complicate things up for us because this is, you know, it's, it's, these are issues that are Brazilian issues that have to be resolved by Brazilians. And here is the, the Brazilian elections and they will have to elect who they think is best. And, um, and we will, uh, you know, have to um, uh, then follow follow with, with whatever the decision is of the Brazilians. So, but it is a very delicate role because, because there are um, forces that want to pull us into, into into the debate and make us part of the problem. That I can imagine. Uh, I am an avid follower of cartoons and graffiti in Brazil, and uh, frequently Tio Sam is present, and uh, it, it, people uh, often enjoy dragging uh, that into the local debate. So, uh, you mentioned the elections. We're about two weeks away from the election, the first round of voting. On current trends, uh, it's not entirely clear that former President Lula will have enough votes to win in the first round of voting, which is on October 2nd. Uh, but he is clearly the front runner, and it's very likely that if he doesn't win on October 2nd, he'll win on October 30th. And so I wanted to ask you, I know um, you were ambassador under another president of the Workers' Party, uh, Dilma Rousseff, and what do you expect based on that experience? What do you anticipate from um, a government led by the Workers' Party today, especially by comparison to either the Workers' Party in 2013 or even the Workers' Party when Lula took office in, in 2003 for the first time. Um, just curious, you know, what your experience was working with the Workers' Party government and also um, to the extent that you're willing to reflect on this, how the Workers' Party has changed uh, over that, that period. Uh, sure. Um, I would say, and I, I did have maybe, I think, three times uh, uh, the opportunity to meet and, and speak with, with Lula at the time, even though he wasn't president, but he had designated uh, Dilma Rousseff. So, um, so there was a very strong, and he was president of the, of the party then, so um, got some of his insights. So I think the question is whether we will see, uh, if, if elected, um, 
a Lula that is pragmatic and moderate leftist, which is what we saw before, or a Lula that is vindictive and more, um, more towards a radical left. Um, you know, and it, it, I always am careful about speculating because you don't know, I mean, how does uh, being in jail impact a person? And, you know, how does that play into your psyche? Uh, I don't know, but if, if he, I would want to think that he would be, he would choose to, to go on the pragmatic side and want to um, have a Brazil that is successful economically on the foreign affairs front and, and is doing what it can economically for its people and to address some of the social promises that, that he's made. Um, but I don't know. I don't know, you know, really what is, uh, how that will all, in his, his recent past will impact uh, his, uh, how he shapes his future agenda. The, the other thing is that the region is very different. Uh, he talks a lot about going back to, you know, how good it was then. And, and yes, there were some, some, some things that everyone highlights, you know, 30, 40 million people graduated into the middle class. And, and you could see that. It was very evident. Um, but the, the country is different today. It doesn't count on the bonanza, the com commodities bonanza that it did then. Uh, the region is different. The world is different. You have the war in the Ukraine. You have post-pandemic uh, issues. So many things to juggle. And, um, you know, what I see is the same people. I mean, um, sort of talking about the same things. And so I, I, I don't know uh, it's it, how that, that's going to, how he's going to shape that. So, um I would hope for um, a pragmatic Lula that wants to have a, a positive relationship with the United States. I mean, he used to say to me, uh, I remember the story and, and he described like, you know, I uh, don't agree with the policies of, you know, of the United States and under Bush, but, you know, we were great friends. We, we would go on horseback together and talk about the world issues and we, you know, we had this great relationship. We, it's, it's important to be a friend of the United States. So, you know, that's the practical part of him. Uh, how could we not be friends and do things together? We do so much business together. Our countries have uh, so much um, uh, things in common. Uh, but, you know, he can become more radicalized. Um, Celso Amorín, who's his foreign affairs uh, advisor, was there before, and he was not very pro-U.S. So if he leads on the foreign affairs front, you know, how will that be shaped? So I guess um, there are some questions as to exactly, you know, once he's sitting in that chair, how he would choose to, to guide that. I'm hopeful that if that is the case, it will be pragmatic he would look to to you know actually uh, put Brazil on a on a on a platform of of a positive agenda of so many things that, that Brazil could do you know whether it's on the environment climate change and a commercial side of things uh, there there there's a lot that can be done um, but um, I don't know I think I, I'm there you know. I, I, I can see it going either way just because of where things are. It's very interesting to hear you you talk about that, uh, knowing the characters involved, Celso Amorín, obviously, and Lula himself, Dilma Rousseff. Um, and as you point out, many of these um, are likely to be similar people in whatever administrative, I mean, not necessarily those three, but, um, yeah, but, I, but there's I a lot of continuity. Say that there were others like um, uh, Aloisio Mercadanchi, who was very helpful in, in and saw the need of, of, you know, and he is also playing a role. So, you know, you've got people there that understand 
uh, even Lacey Hoffman, uh, that wanted things to be worked out with the United States and get things on the right track. And she's still very much around, and so is he. Um, and I found a lot of, of players within the wor Workers' Party that are still around that were very helpful in trying to get Dilma to get like, you know, okay, let's get this thing this back on track. This is not helpful for the country. So, you know, when, when you can have individuals that may not be as open to having this positive relationship, but, but, uh, but you have others. So I don't want to make it sound like it's all negative, but, but uh, it, it depends on where he wants to take it. So I, that actually leads very nicely into my next question. But before I ask it, I'm just going to remind the audience that uh, if you would like to pose a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A um, and we will look at all the questions there. So please look at the bottom of your screen and feel free to add any questions you have. But I, I did want to, Ambassador Ayalda, I wanted to pick up on what you were just talking about, which is essentially the relationship between Brazil and the United States. And I'm always just really puzzled as I think about that relationship. Uh, we have so many things in common. We're the two largest democracies in the Western Hemisphere. We share a number of values. We share a history, as you pointed out, of very close people-to-people -people ties. I, I think that there is very little animosity across the two countries. Um, Increasingly, as you also pointed out, there are very strong business ties, business to business ties. And I'm thinking here of um, dynamic Brazilian companies that have bought into the U.S. market like um, JBS and Anheuser-Busch, which have por partially Brazilian uh, shareholder ownership. And then also American companies or Americans who are present in the business scene in Brazil. And here I think of the owner of Nubank, the owner of JetBlue in Brazil. So these are um, Azul in, in Brazil. And so, you know, there everything seems primed for a much stronger relationship. But I've been working on Brazil since 1994, more or less. And I, it just seems like all too often the the promise, the lofty promise of closer relations is not met. And I, I just wonder if you agree with that statement, first of all, but then uh, if you do agree, where you see the resistance to a stronger partnership between the two countries, how can we get past some of the apparent roadblocks to closer relations between these really important democracies in the hemisphere? Yeah, I have to smile as you as you mentioned this. Uh, yeah, the potential is there for a much deeper and much more robust, I guess, agenda. Uh, there are just tremendous opportunities because we share so much and we have so much in common, and and we're you know, large countries, and, and we could do uh, you know we could do so much more. But Brazil is complicated. Um, and it's not for beginners, like they say. Um, and it's only when you get there, you see how, um, you know, there, I, I, I recall in meeting with various U.S. companies as they came through and uh, they would complain about, I would say at that point, I mean, I, I would imagine that some of it's changed, but not, not all of it. Um, they would complain primarily about the logistics that was very complicated internally, you know, so that may have changed, but probably still, you know, there's still some very um, big challenges in terms of um, uh, transportation internally and getting the raw materials out from one place to the other and so forth, or, or it's just the, 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 the internal connectivity. Um, the um, labor code and the tax code just being very uh, complex in all the, the companies that they needed to have a big staff to try to decipher you know, one from another. And so you've got many layers and uh, just very complex. And so this is very challenging for US companies. So it's difficult to do business, but the, at the end of the day, you're going to do business in, in Brazil because how can you ignore that huge market? And so you will devote, you know, you'll have a huge uh, uh, human resources uh, uh, um, 
uh, office or whatever, and, and a big legal team uh, to try to decipher all of this. So it's a big investment, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a big market. Um, so you do it, um, and I think it's just complicated and and it's it's slow. It's uh, um, it's the custo Brasil is still there. It's just not it's it's not necessarily all disappeared. So, but we're working away on it. And I I look back to see you know where we'd come on the commercial side, and I was enthusiastic to see that they just held the um, uh, 20th uh, commercial dialogue to get at these issues. You know, what, and this is something that between the private sector and the public sector, um, we're sitting down to try to hone in on some of these challenges to try to make business work better. Uh, facilitating trade and you know the regulatory climate, which is so onerous, and and you just kind of work away at these um, and try to uh, address these issues. And I think uh, through that mechanism, they're trying to make progress, but it's slow because it's so huge and it's so big and there's so many layers. So the potential is there. I agree with you, and we just can't get. And then there is the part of the politics, you know. Uh, if you look at the private sector, a lot of them said, you know, we're just going to go on our own and do our thing uh, because you have to have patience and sometimes uh, things don't synchronize. You know, I was seeing that, for instance, there's a lot of opportunities to do um, to open up with a GPS, the general uh, um, what is this? Um, preferences. Products, preferences services. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a whole package of things. And that's kind of stuck. You know, well, why isn't our administration moving that? And you know, so maybe it's it's. I'm not no longer in government, so can't explain why. But I know that there are times political reasons why these things don't don't uh, work as smoothly. So um, it's a matter of synchronizing all these things, and you know, when you align them, then things kind of work out. Uh, and sometimes it just doesn't it just doesn't match. But that's that we're both huge countries and many layers of bureaucracy and many layers of agendas. And it just take takes a lot of uh, perseverance, patience and um, continuity, you know, just can't do it and then drop it and expect for it to just work out. So. Um, sometimes the stops and turns of, 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 of looking at these issues slows things down. But I agree with you. The potential for doing much more and being much more robust is there. Then there is the sense of, of Brazil, you know, Brazil's Brazil, United States, United States. We're so alike in the way. It's just don't tell us what to do. We won't tell you what to do. And, and so there's this whole game of, of knowing this, the psychology of the Brazil-U.S. relationship that um, you know, having lived through it, uh, there is that you have to be very careful because there's, there's this non-interventionist and, but it's not, uh, you know, just be careful about how you present things, where you present things, do a lot, you know, you don't do these things publicly. You, so it's, it's a lot of um, uh, doing things behind the scene, trying to, to work with this thing together and, and trying to to uh, to progress on the on these issues and 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 that takes time. But it's not for beginners and we're I think we just need to continue continue to work at it. Tom Jobim is the famous Brazilian musician who 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 said who is famous for that phrase that Brazil is not for beginners, right? Oh. It's, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I I, I want to go to the audience questions, but before I do, I'll ask one last question that it strikes me that you're just particularly well uh, placed to answer based on your experience both as an ambassador to Brazil, but also as an ambassador to Paraguay. And um, the, the question that I have is really, you know, this is this postdates your time in Brazil, but in recent years there have been a number of experiences of very significant transnational crime um, between Brazil and Paraguay. And I, I'd love to hear your reflection on those as a former uh, U.S. official, and particularly the danger that they pose. And just to give a couple of examples of this, you know, Horacio Cartes, the, the president of Paraguay, 
was indicted a few years ago in Brazil. Um, an, another person who has come to prominence uh, in Brazil-Paraguay relations is uh, Dario Messer, who was a money launderer, who was at the sort of one of the key figures in Lava Jato. And then, of course, there's sort of lower level organized crime that is a concern, for example, the PCC uh, that operates in the tri-border region between uh, Brazil, Paraguay, and, and Argentina. So I just wanted to, I don't think I could find another person who has the experience of having been um, chief of mission in both of the, the two countries I just mentioned, Paraguay and Brazil. And if you could reflect a little bit on the trajectory of crime and organized crime and, and, and how it impacts uh, U.S. relations as well. Yeah, uh, the tri-border area is is a complicated uh, zone. Uh, you know, it does it does allow for all this illicit activity to occur, and you know whether it's money laundering, trafficking, arms and money, and um, uh, people, you, you name it. Um, and you know the fact that uh, public officials uh, can be corrupted. And so there's all of that that goes on that presents a very fertile territory for uh, transnational criminal organizations of all sorts, um, including uh, uh, terrorists, to use it as, uh, you know, uh, however they please. And so it is an area that, that requires some attention. But, you know, it, there is sensitivities by the countries, um, um, you know, whether it's not only well, the three countries engaged that that uh, are, have borders, um, and at times, depending on who's in in in, in the administration, um, they don't want to talk about the the tri-border area or recognize that that it is as big as uh, publicly and. Uh, internationally, that it is a, as big of an issue as it is. They think, you know, we're over um, uh, representing it uh, as, as such. But but there are times that there things come together and yet there is a, um, a, a real attempt to try to address some of the issues. I think they just, Brazil and Paraguay recently signed, I think in April, signed an agreement to exchange intelligence, to work on joint operations, to try to um, address some of the bureaucratic hurdles in trying to um, uh, get at some of these uh, illegal crimes. So they're at a good point, meaning that they want to share and, and do these things together. It doesn't always happen. Um, with the United States, we've had in the past these, um, this mechanism, um, it's called the three plus one. And again, that's been on and off, depending on the interest of the countries. Part of it is, is you know, they don't want to highlight uh, some of these issues uh, internationally, but they recognize that. And I understand Paraguay has been doing much more recently and trying to address some of these issues that have international impact. So, you know, we do care about it uh, because there are, um, you know, this is an area with a, a large uh, Lebanese um, diaspora, not necessarily that everyone is, is, is corrupt or doing involved, engaged in illegal business, but it's just more prone. Uh, and so uh, we have to be very careful. So, but it's one of these areas that it sounds like it's easy that we could tackle it, but for some reason it just keeps on, um, there's a lack of alignment, you know, like when we had this three plus one at one point, everyone agreed on it. And then Argentina said, no, I don't want anything, any part of this. So, you, you know, you start again. And, and uh, so we need to keep at it because definitely um, with these groups, the PCC and, and, and others um, have increased their activity in the region. I mean, when I was there, you know, you knew they were there, but it wasn't as evident. And of course, that, that, that has increased. And their engagement with other illegal groups, uh, you know, they're now linked to the Mexicans and and, and, and it just becomes much closer to home and, and, and of course, um, a real security uh, challenge for 
forward, not only for that part of the, of the, of the hemisphere, but for, for the entire, uh, the entire hemisphere. Well, that's uh, really interesting, and I uh, I was reminded as you were speaking about um, the the poor Paraguayan prosecutor who was murdered beachside in Colombia recently, uh, showing you know exactly what you just described uh, in terms of the trans hemispheric threat that this poses. So. I uh, appreciate your mentioning that. So uh, let me go to the questions here. We have a number of questions and I'm going to try to bring them all together. Um, I think I can do it as two very large questions and I've been giving you large questions all day so I know you can handle it. So uh, I'm going to create one uh, foreign policy question and one question about Brazilian politics. In terms of Brazilian politics, the questions are all about the election. Um, some questions, if uh, Bolsonaro refuses to hand over office, what would be the U.S. reaction? How would it affect relations with the U.S.? Associated with that, um, if Bolsonaro wins, what would that mean for U.S.-Brazil relations? And then, um, uh, if I can add to that one more, what is the legacy of Jair Bolsonaro for Brazilian politics going forward, given that he still has the support of about a third of the population and may um, some of those supporters may be elected to Brazil's Congress uh, or re-elected to Brazil's Congress in the upcoming election. So, um, you know, feel free to take that. There's a very broad range of things here, but I think it's essentially about what is what would be the impact of a Bolsonaro victory? What would be the impact of a Bolsonaro contested loss? And what is the legacy of Bolsonaro on domestic politics? Um, so let's see. The impact of uh, the easier one, I guess. <laughs> um, the impact of, um, of continuity, uh, meaning um, of Bolsonaro win is basically well continuity of the 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 nature of the and if we're talking about U.S. relations, um, a continuity of what we have right now, I would think. Uh, and um, so there's there there is an agenda that that uh, that is bilaterally being worked on. Um, Probably because of the aggressive language and and uh, continued controversy, you know, it's probably not as as robust as it could be, and that will probably continue to to pace along uh, with its abrupt uh, stops and turns, and you know, that's a work of a, a challenge in diplomacy. Um, and if it's contested. Um, it's complicated because obviously, um, officially, the, the U.S. will have to uh, take a stance um, and how that will, um, the impact of that is, 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 is serious. And so um, I can, and I could anticipate just you know, a lot of turmoil around deciphering what that would mean. I'm sure that our U.S. Congress would pronounce itself and so on and so forth. That's not to mean that we have our own issues. So, um, but it, it, I can anticipate that that would be a very complicated road uh, to progress on, you know, what we can and cannot do in a contested um, one where, you know, if, let's say if there are um, international observers and uh, everyone is saying, you know, this this was clean and and, and yet there there's a contested. You know, then then we've got a, a mess uh, that, that an international mess that we will have to attend to very carefully. But it definitely would have uh, repercussions um, all around, um, no doubt. So so that would be a, a complicated scenario to look at. Um, then uh, the legacy. Um, well, I think I, you know I was looking at some of the work that that had been done, and and, and again I'm just focusing on some of of the bi the bilateral agenda, which is quite robust in terms of of, of 
sectoral engagements, you know, everything from space to um, agriculture, uh, education, uh, commercial, and so forth. Um, you know, there's, this, or, there's been work that's been done because it goes under the radar. And I think um, there's progress and those things, uh, you know, you get closer to the kind of potential that you're talking about and maybe not reaching that potential. And so uh, that's been constructed because you know, there, there is an interest in having that relationship work. Uh, so at some level, things get done, maybe not um, as much as one would like. So, um, but it's been a lot of turmoil um, uh, on the human rights side and, and you know, with the allegations, whether true or not, and I'm not gonna get into any specifics, but it's been tough, you know, on the environmental side and um, uh, with some of the language used on um, uh, discriminatory language on regards to women, regards to you know, racial uh, statements and all of that. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag, I would say, um, that um, it's, it's not, uh, it's that one would have to describe it much more amply um, because you cannot ignore some very, very rough areas um, um, that are still there. Which actually maybe uh, proves the, the wisdom of a person to person, people to people approach to foreign policy that, um, you know, uh, it goes beyond the current government um, and, and allows us to engage with a variety of stakeholders. So, exactly. so um, a, a second group of questions uh, is, is about foreign policy. And um, uh, uh, one of them comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, how does the Brazilian government respond and engage with the new geopolitical reality concerning the war in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. And just to prompt you a little bit further on that, I would imagine that that has an impact both with regard to Brazil's participation in the BRICS, uh, perhaps the G20, things that were dear to Lula's heart, uh, but also uh, the war also has an impact on commodities, which are so important to Brazil's fortune. Uh, so, you know, whatever you would like to say about that, but I, peg I took the question, but I added a couple of elements to it. Yeah, um, definitely a different world, uh, much more complex. Um, at the end of the day, I think Brazil looks out for its own markets, um, and you know it's a second agricultural producer in the world, and uh, the ag sector is an important um, uh, sector, uh, and and so it can't be ignored whether whether under a Lula administration or under under a Bolsonaro. And um, the war has impacted seriously the ability for Brazil to get um, fertilizers and, and so forth. And, but at the same time, it provides tremendous opportunities because of food insecurity in, around the world as a result of, 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 of the pressure on, on commodities. So, so there is a role for Brazil to play um, in, in this global stage. And so it's a matter of how you use that um, and, and um, how it can be a player in, in, in responding to uh, food insecurity. For instance, I would see just a tremendous amount of opportunities there. Um, I'm always at awe at, at you know, the, the agriculture expertise uh, from the research perspective and BRAPA and, and so forth of what they can do, um, what they are doing. Um, and in fact, when I was there, we, we would um, bring in some exchanges from U.S. farmers to, to Brazil and so and Brazilian farmers to the U.S. And, and they, 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 they always, all of them walked away with learning something from each other. Um, so there's a great benefit in, in sharing this. And, and what better time than in times of crisis? And there, there is a food crisis. And, and I think that Brazil can play a, a big role in it. Um, but it's also on the posturing, you know, how does Brazil decide to, to um, uh, play its, its, its role in the, in the global agenda uh, in, in multilateral organizations and 
um, uh, um, being at, at times there is uh, uh, these these things are played for a domestic agenda, uh, and so and, and that might be the case in uh, for Bolsonaro. You know, at times he's playing to his domestic core support and and not necessarily to the international um, uh, stage. And so I think there are opportunities for Brazil, uh, for Brazil to to play a, a more of a states uh, statesman's role in in these issues um, and engage uh, positively in, in in this changing world that, that is is so complex. It has a very large uh, Ukrainian um, diaspora which one would think would play a role in 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 the way these things are decided but again you know it just depends on who the leadership is and how you can how you can shape this well that's that's really interesting uh you were too diplomatic to say what i was thinking which is bolsonaro when you mentioned posturing i was thinking of the past few days of bolsonaro's speeches on the world stage which uh, went over poorly to the domestic audience, but were intended for the domestic audience. Yeah, I think in general, Brazilians like to see themselves positively in the global stage, you know, so that that's something that um, sometimes is not measured, but they like to be seen as, as you know, uh, playing a role in Minusta. That was when I was there, of course, in, in the case of the Haiti um, situation. You know, they were very, um, uh, they played a leadership role in, in the peacekeeping operations. And and they liked that. They liked to be seen um, in Brazil um, playing these uh, these important roles. So. so if I could, we have only two more minutes and I want to be, I want to get in one more question. Um, I'm going to summarize a question that's here that is sort of the flip side of what you were discussing about agriculture. And that is uh, about uh, deforestation in Brazil. Summarizing grossly uh, a question here from the audience, how can the U.S. and the international community assist Brazil to diversify its export portfolio in a way that combats the problems of deforestation but still benefits the Brazilian economy? You know, I think, you know, I'm not an expert on agriculture, but what I did learn <laughs> is that there are ways of having sustainable, sustainable agriculture practices. So there are ways of, of sustainable forest management um, where you can have the local communities engaging in agriculture at the same time sustaining their, their natural resources. But it takes training. It takes, you know, it takes policy. It takes resources. It takes commitment, um, and and it's 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 a way of balancing both uh, because you've you've got these indigenous communities and they ha have to live and they have to, but at the same time, you know, uh, you've got the encroachment of the uh, the pushing of the agricultural um, uh, uh, frontier. And so it, it's it's a way. How can you how can you expand these practices that are that balance these 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 issues out in a way that you can have um, a diminished uh, uh, or reforestation as opposed to deforestation, um, and at the same time look for other ways of of of, of having sustainable agriculture where um, you know the small farmers continue to have. They need an income, uh, and they need to survive. And it's not, not only about the, the the large landowners, but there but, but there is technology that we could work on uh, to try to to make it safer, to make it cleaner, to make it um, more sustainable, um, uh, while looking at our, our natural resources. And um, uh, but at the same time, recognizing that there's a practical. Uh, reality of, of you know people need to to live and survive and prosper um, but you can do that sustainably fantastic well uh, I want to thank you heartily uh, it is wonderful to have had you here uh, ambassador Ayalde thank you very much for joining us uh, you are just a great example of uh, a distinguished alumna and uh, you make all of us at SIS extremely proud 
For the audience, uh, just want to remind you that we will uh, be having another uh, w event uh, led by Prof Professor Emeritus Phil Brenner on Cuba and Cuba policy in the coming weeks. So look out for an announcement. And uh, please join me in thanking Ambassador Ayalde. Good day. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Taylor. This has been a great opportunity to re-engage with uh, the, the SIS community. I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Have a good night.